You're listening to Ask the Expert on Sprott Money News. Hello and welcome back to Ask the Expert here on Sprott Money News. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. And on the line with me today, we have our chairman, Mr. Eric Sprott. Now, of course, many of you know who Eric is. He speaks to us each week here on the weekly wrap-up. Eric Sprott is a chairman of Sprott Money Limited as well as Sprott Inc. with more than 40 years of experience in the investment industry. Eric has earned a recognized standing not only as one of the world's premier gold and silver investors, but also as an expert in the precious metal industry. And at that, we'd like to welcome Mr. Eric Sprott. Good morning, Eric. Hey, Jeff. Good to be here. Thank you for joining us. So, Eric, again, we have a number of questions here from our, our listeners. Let's take a look at one of them, first of all, here. So, it's widely understood about precious metals that it performs well when there's economic or global upheaval. With multiple crises going on simultaneously, such as the Russia-USA-Ukraine situation, as well as the Israel-Palestine conflict, do you see precious metals rising very soon? Well, Jeff, there's no doubt that um, with all the tension in the world, the average person would have a higher inclination to to wanting a physical asset. And anyone in the Middle East or in in Europe could see that this tension can spread from one place to another. None of these situations have been resolved. They're ongoing. They're kind of flaring up. We even had the you know the Ukraine Prime Minister resigning yesterday, and it looks like their parliament might dissolve. Uh, so there's there's lots of reasons for people to consider owning um, owning precious metals. We also have a situation in Asia, you know, where there's lots of tension between China and Vietnam, China and Japan, uh, even China. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, China, U.S., uh, which could be explosive. I've never been one to to use that as a factor for uh, necessarily owning gold, although it is one. But it's not my primary reason to suggest that people should own uh, precious metals. My primary reason is just simply uh, an excess of demand over supply. And obviously, I believe that the paper markets, where they have unlimited supply of paper gold, have restrained prices, and ultimately, uh, we're going to win that war. I've written many articles about the central banks possibly having no gold left, and I think there's very, very much evidence of that. Of course, the people of Ghana have done a great job of uh, explaining that. We see some uh, very odd data that, you know, the UK is a huge exporter of gold. Well, they, they don't produce any gold. The US exports more gold than they produce. And you, you got to wonder, what, you know, where is this gold coming from? If you don't produce it, where is it coming from? And, of course, the assumption I would make is it's coming from the central banks, and they're totally non-transparent about their transactions, and that, in fact, there is way more demand than supply, and sooner or later, this will play out in the markets. There's been a lot of speculation as to where the manipulation of precious metals uh, are coming from. Do you still believe it is the Fed manipulating these markets, or could it be the Chinese? Well, uh, first of all, I think the central banks are part of it. There's no doubt about that. And then, and really, uh, since uh, there's a great book written by uh, Dimitri Speck called The Gold Cartel, and he indicated that gold manipulation started on August 5th, 1993, uh, basically led by central banks for the, the purpose of uh, maintaining credibility of their currencies. They, they have this theory that if they keep gold down, uh, no one will will be concerned about owning um, fiat money, uh, but I think laterally, it's it's the manipulation has obviously been amongst the commercial banks. I think they figured out that with their very deep pockets, that they could kind of overrun the uh, the natural buyers of um, of paper gold and force the price to do what they wanted. And as I've discussed many times, I think they play this game in the options market where they um, they cause their customers who who are long options to lose the premiums constantly, and every option expiry, the price of gold goes down. Uh, but I think it's it. so. I think it's transferred itself over to the commercial banks. Luckily, we have a number of investigations going on, whether it's in Britain or Germany, not so much the U.S. Um, but there's lots of investigations into. Uh, manipulation of the gold market. And I, so today I think it's a combination of both the central banks and the commercial banks, perhaps working in cahoots. Because let's face it, the central banks, by their zero interest rate policy and printing of money, have kept the banking industry in a profitable position, much to the detriment, of course, of the, uh, 
the the public and, and savers because you can't get any return on your money anymore. But right. the, the the intent of everything was to make sure that banks were profitable because post Lehman, effectively, they were all broke and they needed to open up the spread so they could make their their interest margins, have their bond portfolios go up. So they have worked hand in hand, and I would not be surprised to believe that in the gold and silver markets, they worked hand in hand as well. Right. Now, let's also take a look here. I mean, alternatively, source data shows that there's a significant worldwide demand that exists for physical precious metals. However, COMEX deliveries in the past year paint a different picture. Why is there such a huge discrepancy between what COMEX deliveries are telling us and what non-mainstream data sources are telling us? Sure. Well, you know what's interesting? I mean, I look at the COMEX data every day. And um, when I look at the position of the inventories of the uh, commercial dealers, it has stayed the same for so long, day after day after day. I think the number is 23.117 tons. It never, never changes. Wow. I mean, it's all, it's just, it's, it's uh, impossible that that could be the case. So I might argue that the, the COMEX date is tainted that they'll just say whatever they want to say. In fact, I found it very interesting that there was a lawsuit just filed against uh, the CME and one of their principals for facilitating high-frequency trading in the in the CME, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, um, and giving priority to certain uh, high-frequency traders. Uh, the, the suit was just filed, I think, uh, yesterday, Thursday, maybe on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's probably available to the public. I haven't actually specifically looked at it yet, but um, I just think that, uh, you know, they, they, the COMEX data is, is corrupted. It, it's very hard to make any sense of it all. Uh, the fact that there's no deliveries from the dealers is, is incredible. You, you think there'd be some change in the inventory. I don't care whether it's up or down, but at least you think there'd be some change. Right. How can we trade, how can we trade like two and 300 million ounces a year, which is, uh, sorry, a day, a day, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, 25 to 30 percent of the world's production on a yearly basis. We trade it every day, and yet there's never a change in the dealer inventory. It, it's just beyond belief, and therefore I'm not. Uh, I, I tend not to believe in the COMEX data. Kind of sticking with the idea of, of the CME, uh, let's take a look, Eric. They recently announced that the CME will be taking over the daily silver fix in August. So can you explain why we need a silver fix in the first place, Eric? There isn't a separate fixing body for other commodities. Is a silver one essential? How do you see this affecting your predictions on the price of silver? Well, I don't really think you need a fix, quite frankly. I mean, most of these markets are 24-hour markets. Uh... I mean, somebody might argue that you need it for pricing at a specific time for some contracts that are out there. Uh, but I suppose, you know, one could just say, well, here's where we, here's where silver was trading at, let's say, 10 a.m. London time this day and, 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 and make that the price for contracts to settle. Uh, but there seems to be no doubt that the LBMA fix was fixed. And, of course, we've seen examples of manipulation where Barclays was fined there, I think it was 40-odd million dollars for manipulating the price back in 2013. Uh, as I've said before, you see these weird trades on COMEX when options expire. I mean, it's just it's a game that the, the, the boys with the money can play and, and, and move things around. Uh, I, I wish they would have disbanded the fix, well, have disbanded the fix, particularly when it manifested itself, because you had five traders sitting on the phone for five minutes deciding where things would go. And, of course, in the meantime, they were placing orders to to uh, to, to make their, their books look more attractive to them and or participating in the market before the fix was made. So there's no doubt that it's uh, it's outdated. It, it shouldn't be used and will not be used. But uh, the fact that We've got the CME back in there is is uh, somewhat distressing to most of us uh, precious metals holders who want to deal in the physical market. Right. Now, again, kind of sticking with the idea of the silver fix, now, with the silver fix changing and talks of implementing the reforms to the gold fix and transitioning to an electronic platform, what effects do you see occurring and will it affect price movements? Well, that's that's something we don't know because who who knows what's really happening in any fix Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, people have to, some group of people have to come together and say, this is the fix. 
you know, if they have a predisposition towards uh, the price wanting to be one way or another, I mean, one of those three members can affect that price. So I, I, I just think that we have a nice uh, 24-7 market. We, we don't need a fixing price. I wish that uh, people who have, uh, in my mind, in my mind, uh, proven that they're not reliable in terms of data and the proper markets and the regulation of those markets are now uh, part of this process. So um, I'm not going to be big on fix. I don't think it's going to, I really don't think it's going to make any difference. I think the thing that'll make a difference in the precious metals market is, you know, a regulator who, uh, who wants to step up and challenge these traders. And I'm more thinking of the, uh, the regulator in Germany who would look, who's asked to trade information from the various banks that are involved in trading gold in Germany will come out with some kind of a resolution uh, that, in fact, the banks were moving the prices so that their option books uh, would make them more money than otherwise would be the case. That's the sort of thing that I think would kind of upset the apple cart in the paper markets. Either that, or we just find out that there's some physical shortage, whether it's Chinese or Indian, where somebody uh, goes to buy gold and finds, finds out that in, in reality, and based on our own analysis, that the central banks are running on empty here and sooner or later we just the whole thing skyrockets and people lose confidence in currencies and uh, economic recoveries and I mean there's so much data that says it's impossible to have a recovery and of course one, one of the reasons you, you could you keep going to economics is if there's no recovery the 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 effect on the banking business is very bad because people can't re, people and corporations can't repay debt Right, and, and that, that's why I keep talking about the economy because if there's no ability to pay back debt, then these very very levered banks uh, suffer catastrophic losses because it takes so little decline in asset value to wave up their capital. And we've already seen it, a number of instances. Uh, we have the one in Portugal. I think we had one in Bulgaria. There's talk of some banks in Austria being in trouble uh, because of all the. Uh, economic weakness that prevails pretty well throughout the world here. So that's why I, I keep looking at economics to to affect the banking industry. And when people realize that you get nothing for having your money in a bank, and when you put your money in a bank, you're a creditor. Exactly. And when you're a creditor, you can get bailed in. And what's what's the point of making 0.1% return when your chance of getting bailed in on some bank failure is that you could lose, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% of your money. It just doesn't make any sense. So uh, to me, people having money out of the banking system and, and in real assets is exactly uh, what people should be doing these days. Kind of, again, sticking with the whole idea of currencies now. So we hear so much about U.S. currency and other currencies like the euro and yen and, you know, these upcoming crises that you've kind of described. So how do you see the Canadian dollar and the economy's reaction to the global economic crisis? Well, I mean, the Canadian dollar should be one of the stronger currencies, but all currencies are flawed. And they're flawed in the sense that by having created this zero interest rate environment, the cost of government's borrowing money is, is as negligible as you can get it. And therefore, the willingness to increase, keep increasing deficit spending is quite significant and to keep ignoring the increasing obligations. And I always turn to uh, the U.S., which they publish every year, you know, what, their, um, what the present value of their, their um, future liabilities is. And every year it goes up by about $5 trillion. Well, the GDP is seventeen trillion. The government has revenue of three trillion. They spend four trillion, and they got an extra five trillion of obligations at the end of each year. And those obligations are pushing towards eighty trillion dollars now. And any thinking person would know that this organization that is three trillion in revenue cannot meet these obligations. And it's not just the U.S. I'm sure it's you know Japan, England, and the various European countries. They all keep making promises that they know they can't keep, and therefore, it's another reason not to believe in currencies, because someday they're going to default on their promises. There's no doubt 
They will default on their promises or they'll, or they'll just keep printing money and the money that they pay to these people at these claims will be worth very, very little because in reality, the economies can't afford it. Well, Eric, let's take a look at something that's been quite the hot topic in the last few weeks or the few months for that matter. There's been rising concern about fraudulent gold bars coming out of China. What can an average investor do to protect themselves and their investments? How would you recommend Canada or the Royal Canadian Mint solve this rising phenomenon? Well, you have to deal with reputable people, okay? And there's no doubt that, for example, when we buy bars, we buy them from you know, regulated institutions who, who, who will stand behind the product. Um, you, ha- you have to know that whoever it is that's selling you the gold is selling you bona fide gold. I mean, I don't know that it's been uh, proven that there's a lot of fake gold. I know there's, there are stories of some fake gold for sure. The scale on which it's been done, I have no idea because, you know, we've only had a few instances of, you know, 10 kilo bars, a yard 400 kilo bar where someone has suggested that there were substitutes for the gold in there. But I think if people stick to, you know, whether it's buying from the Royal Canadian Mint or Sprott Money or reputable dealers who, whose business would just absolutely disappear if uh, people found out they were selling fraudulent products, that's who, who you have to deal with. And, I, I you know, it's, it's quite obvious who those people are at any time. It's, and, and most of them have been around a long time. And, and those are the people that uh, customers should deal with. So... Now someone's asked a question more or less uh, about a, a previous Ask the Expert guest. So in a past Jim Willie interview on Ask the Expert, Dr. Willie advised against mining stocks, saying that they're going to go into reverse and under extreme risk. What are your thoughts on mining stocks, Eric? Well, I, I don't agree with that the thesis. I mean, I obviously believe that the price of gold and silver will rise dramatically before the end of this year. I still stick with that, okay? And in that environment, you will see a massive increase in uh, the valuation of of gold stocks. We saw in the first two months of this year, a 40% rise in the gold stocks. It then retreated. We've seen about a 30% rise recently in the gold stocks. It just shows you how the market can react quickly. And this is with gold still trading, you know, thirteen to fourteen hundred dollars. Imagine if it started going back up to fourteen, fifteen, sixty. I mean, it's going to bring a world of investment into the market, mm-hmm. and of course, people will buy those stocks. And and I would say conversely, that people uh, should realize that the general stock market, in my mind, is a great risk here because it's sort of followed along with the degree of money printing. And you just can't keep doing this forever. It, it will, the money printing will show up in inflation. We're seeing higher inflation data now. Um, and I, I think that the risk of owning stocks, which have risen so dramatically since '09, well, basically, GDP has done nothing. Sales revenues have hardly done anything. Miraculously, earnings go up. But I can guarantee you that if your sales don't go up, you have a very difficult time having your earnings go up unless you you're causing your suppliers, most particularly labor, to take lower wages. Right. Well, lower wages implies declining GDP. And this is kind of what we're seeing manifested in the U.S. where you get know, all these part-time workers, the full-time jobs disappear. You know, we say that the unemployment claim they're down by whatever. But the fact is that the way it's it's worked out in the U.S., most employers, particularly their huge employers, want to empl- employ somebody for 29 and a half hours, i.e. below the 30 hours it would cause them to have to make payments and pensions and other benefits. So that worker, in order to, to have the same incomes, needs one and one-third jobs. Wow. <laughs> so we, we get jobs created, but they're not... There's no extra income being generated, and and that's the problem with looking at labor data, which is it isn't showing you the effect on the average person. We did a, a recent report uh, that's on Sprout.com, showing that the um, the top uh, sorry the bottom forty percent every year they're spending more than they make, and if it wasn't for government handouts, particularly in the form of food stamps, they would have been going hugely backward because their wages are under pressure, their hours are under pressure. So that's um, that's a, a, a huge element that uh, people should be concerned with here. As well, I mean, 
there's been a lot of questions about gold production, kind of sticking with the mining idea. So since gold production costs have increased substantially in the past 10 years, is there a possibility that these higher costs will drive large gold producers out of business given the current market prices? Well, there's no doubt that it's causing some companies today to alter their strategies. You know, we have somebody like Barrick selling off all sorts of mines. We had lots of producers that have decided to high grade and try to become more efficient in their existing mines, which of course means you're leaving behind some of the gold that you would otherwise produce in order to to try to hold it together with the, this low price environment. And all of those factors, of course, will lead to lesser production in the future because once you bypass some ore, you, it's very difficult to get back at it because you fill, of course, the, the, in an under, the case of an underground mine, you filled it in, you don't have access to it anymore. Mm-hmm. So I think that um, that we will see production going down here. We know that exploration expenditures have fallen dramatically. We know that developments have fallen dramatically. We've seen lots of big developments postponed. So the outlook on the supply side is, you know, we haven't got, we haven't in, not increased supply in the last 14 years. It's been about the same every year, 2,700 tons of gold for 14 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I suspect that as we go into even the latter part of this year, into 15, 16, 17, there's no way that production can go up if prices stay at these levels. So I don't really, I mean, some of them may go out of business as well. We've had lots of mines shut down. Uh, but I wouldn't particularly say that, you know, the large guys will go out of business. I think at, you know, $1,300 gold, most people can hold on here. But holding on is one thing. Increasing production is another one. And, and t- t- to the question, I think the, the real impact will be on future production. Now, uh, looking at, I mean, you kind of talked about what your thoughts are as far as gold prices towards the end of the year. Um, one of our guests wants to know, many are predicting gold prices are going to correct itself down to 1100 Where do you see gold and silver prices going? Well, I might point out that these experts are all commercial banks, all of whom have profited immensely on the decline in the price of gold. Uh, we had, you know, four to six sigma events in the gold price last year, which are only supposed to happen once every 40,000 years. I have no doubt that... Uh, in my mind, it, there's a distinct possibility that they acted in concert on that. Uh, you know, these thousand dollar price projections been around them. I think the most famous one was from uh, Goldman Sachs. I believe that this last week they raised their price to twelve hundred dollars, uh, maybe on the way to much higher prices. Because it seems obvious to anyone involved that if the price got that low, there would be the demand from India and China and many, many other countries. Would would rise very dramatically here. So I don't I don't think that's a reasonable assumption. I, I think that the supply demand data that we analyze all the time suggests there's a shortage, and that the paper markets will be overrun here, and that we'll see much, we have to see much higher prices. Excellent, Eric. Well, Eric, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, uh, Ask the Expert. Again, it's been a while since we've spoken to you, and we look forward to speaking to you again on our program. Well, Jeff, thank you, and. Um, to all your listeners, I think uh, staying the course is the appropriate thing. It could be a very exciting time here in the next uh, next six months. So all the best to all your investors. Thank you very much. And to our listeners, thank you for listening. Please go to SproutMoney.com for more information. For Ask the Expert here on Sprout Money News, I'm Jeff Rutherford. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.